Thank you for listening to Draw Near with Fred and Kara. And today we have a very special guest. And the guest is not our kids who are running around and eating breakfast right outside the door, even I, though you might hear them. You will hear them. Yeah, you're going to hear them. Guaranteed. Um, but we have a guest today, and she's a very good friend of ours. Um, just an amazingly kind person who unknowingly helps me in my spiritual life often. Um, and just altogether really wise. So we thought she'd be really good to bring on. And that is Sister Fidelis Marie. So welcome, Sister. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, would you like to share anything about yourself? Um, sure. I, I know you're, I know that's like your favorite thing to do. So. <laughs> right. Um, yes, of course. Talking about myself. I love it. Um, <laughs> yes, I am a missionary Benedictine sister and I have been a sister for 11 years now and I do a lot of vocation work, um, spiritual direction, college ministry, and I'm here stationed in Sioux City. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited to hang out this morning. This nice. may be my first podcast. I'm not sure. Really? But, awesome. Yeah. Well, you're one of our very few guests. We don't have guests very often. Yeah. And I've already decided, I haven't talked to Kara yet, but I've already decided we want to invite you back. I did say okay. we want to invite yeah, you back yeah. again. No, so. we talked about that. We were talking about different topics we want to cover. And we're like, right. ooh, sister would be so Oh, good. yeah, oh, we good. did talk about that. Okay, yeah. so I don't feel guilty anymore for <laughs> yeah. collectively deciding. For us. That's yeah. We did decide. Okay. Yeah, no, I feel special. That's good. What are yeah. some uh, hobbies that you like to do? Oh, definitely napping. Any oh, that's I good. Get, yes. Mm -hmm. I may have slept extra this morning um, <laughs> so yeah napping i am originally from florida so anything with the sun i'm like a little cat i find any patch of sun in the house and sit there i used um, to do that too all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and definitely just uh reading listening to music watching the huskers get yeah bread <laughs> nice. That's awesome. You are also an Office fan, as I recall. Oh, is that yes. correct? That's the background on your computer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely awesome. am. Yeah, so are we. Big yeah, Office fans. Yeah, that's her. Yeah. I don't have my world's best boss cup with me. Yeah. I wish I did. Yeah. So. I feel like worse than the pandemic was when they took the Office off Netflix. Oh, yeah. yeah. That hit harder for me. Yes. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't even remember, sister, how we met. Um, I feel like it was just like casual, gradual encounters. And then like right. we both we both went and we were speakers at that girls conference or girls retreat. Oh, yeah, and I basically right. like forced my friendship on you. So yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's how it happened. Yeah. I feel like we bonded because we both couldn't really eat the lunch they provided. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like picking all we're, the things. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be friends. <laughs> Let's be yeah. friends together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Well, that's and then awesome. like it just kind of happened where I don't know. I feel like you started. We started inviting you over for like a lot of our young adult stuff too. Yeah. And that I think that was really fun. And your uh, si your other sister, who is awesome, sister Laura Ann. So that was really fun. And I remember um, we don't have a lot of sisters who wear habits in our area. Mm. And I'm gonna tell the story about Clara. Oh, I love it. Uh, we so when they like first walked in the door and they're all they're both wearing their habits. My daughter Clara goes up to him and she just gets so excited and she's like, oh, "Are you from Jesus?" <laughs> and it was like the most precious thing ever. <laughs> and I loved Sister Laura Ann's response. She just kind of smiled. She got her big smile and just goes, "We are." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that if was that was only our entrance into every room, people yeah. would right. how great would that be? <laughs> Are yeah. you from Jesus? Are you from Jesus? <laughs> yeah. Well, now yeah. I've kind of used it as like a teaching moment because we were listening to this song the other day, and I told you about this story, sister. We were listening to this song. Um, I think it's Raise the Hallelujah, if I'm remembering right. But there's this line in there that says, the king is alive. And every single time, Clara goes, Mom, did you know the king is Jesus? <laughs> and so then I tried to teach her. I was like, so Clara, you know those sisters who are from Jesus? Well, they're actually married to Jesus. So does that make them princesses? And she's she just got really excited and was like, oh, I want to be from Jesus. <laughs> so I'm like, well, we'll pray about that one. <laughs> yes, girl, let's go. <laughs> yeah, so but I, th I think it was that same night when you guys came over, there was just like a lot going on at the house, different people in different conversations and apparently yeah. you and Fred just had this like I don't know, ridiculously. It was a great conversation. Yeah. yeah. And was there was so epic discussion. It, yeah. I mean, one person was the only other person there. Danny, if you're listening, you're the reason we're doing this show yeah. because you, you said it was good conversation and you felt blessed. So we wanted to share it with everybody and try to relive that a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, and you're from Jesus, right? So we know this is going to be good. <laughs> Talk about a good first impression, though. Like yeah. you walk in the room and somebody says, you, are you from Jesus? Yeah. I feel like you can just leave at that point. Yeah. Like, yeah. You don't have to do I, anything I else. You know. I love that that was her first interaction to a sister. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so what was that epic discussion about, Fred? Because I missed out. I wasn't there. Yeah, so. you, you weren't. You were playing code names, as I recall, because yes, yes. it was a game night, yeah. which we need to do more uh, another one soon, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, so the topic of the discussion we were talking about, and we've mentioned this on a previous episode, the Made for Greatness Young Adult Conference that we had done. And we, we talked about um, what does Made for Greatness mean? And we were kind of unpacking that, like this call to holiness. How do we live that call to holiness? And why do so many of us struggle with seeing that call to holiness, that call to gr greatness, that finding our vocation so much as a future destination that someday I'll get there, but I'm not there yet, you know, and, and how do we get all trapped in that process? And, and what does that look like? And I remember it being a great conversation. Um, and I remember probably three quarters of the way through thinking, I wish we were recording this, mm -hmm. you know, so, right. um, I'm curious, sister, because um, if we're going to talk about vocations, well, one, I think it's important to note that, like, this is a conversation that isn't only about vocations, but also about living out that holiness that we're called to now. So I don't want people to think, oh, well, they're talking about vocations. I'm already living in mine. I don't need to listen to this one. Mm -hmm. It is going to be relevant to everybody. But I'm curious before we kind of get into that, like mm -hmm. what what your vocation story is and kind of how you really felt called and discerned where you were supposed to be as a, a bride of Christ. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yes. Discernment, I feel, was actually really rough, a rough go for me. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of ups and downs. So I think in hindsight, it's become like a blessing to have that experience because I feel like I can journey with people in a different way now that are like actively discerning. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just was that kid who grew up and was always tolerated by my peers, not so much bullied, but I would say like more emotionally kind of bullied in a way that mm -hmm. just basically from middle school, high school, I'd walk into a room and I didn't have that you're from Jesus experience. It was very much like, oh, she's here. I guess we'll like let her be in our conversations, but we really don't want her here kind of vibe. Yeah. And so um, we had a newly ordained priest and religious sister as a DRE at our parish. And they just really had a huge impact on me, especially as a middle schooler, because they mm -hmm. invested in me. And it was that very... Um, epic like being fully seen known and loved and how that just changes hearts and impacts people um yeah. and so just was really seen known and loved as a middle schooler by these two beautiful religious and um just made me want to be a sister i was intrigued by the life i was intrigued by the joy um and just everything about them i was a shy kid so i would like observe people a lot and just saw that the joy they had was authentic and tangible. Mm -hmm. And then I think as I grew in my teenage years, our parish started perpetual adoration. And so my faith life became more my own mm -hmm. and not just my family's who were just awesome at nurturing that faith and really forming me well. And then I did a year with Net Ministries after high school. And again, just doing like a year of service. I think service is just so great for helping clear the mind and like getting outside of yourself and I think the Lord can really speak to someone when they're engaging in service. Yeah. And so, again, just kind of like growing in my faith, learning my identity as like a daughter of God and seeing myself as a part of the church and having a purpose. And then after that year, being really like an adult and what am I going to do with my life? And the thought of vocation came back, but it was kind of a place where I had actually found my niche for the first time. And so mm -hmm. I was really nervous to start discerning that vocation yeah. um, because it could actually be a reality. And so I had a lot of ups and downs in the discernment. Um, just first of all, like how you find sisters and I'm not that old, but like Google wasn't even really a thing yeah. or the internet. So it was like how you find sisters and then just, um, yeah, having different interactions with different communities and not really knowing if I fit, but I think I was always attracted to the life. I was always affirmed every time I went for a visit in the life as a whole. And then it was just narrowing it down to 
okay, which order? And when I fell upon our sisters, it just, everything just clicked. And it, it really felt like I belonged. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I like that too, because it's not like, I mean, it's, it's even pre discernment and knowing where you were supposed to be that you were still like going to adoration and trying to get involved in the faith. So it wasn't like, well, I feel called to be a sister, so I can't do anything until I'm a sister. Right. Right. And that, I know that was really like kind of the topic of that discussion at my right. house. So yeah. mm-hmm. that I missed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The question really was, what do I do when I'm not in my vo- vocation? Yeah. Right. Or, or I haven't found my vocation, but I, I think sometimes people treat vocation as a future destination and they just kind of flail along the way until they find it. You know, you know what I mean? As sister, right. maybe you could speak. Have, yeah. Have, have you I, encountered that? Yeah. And I think that the, I get like so passionate about this topic because I do journey with so many um, young adults. Um, both men and women in so many different capacities. And I feel that vocation um, has become like really trending. Like there's so much awareness over the past like two decades about vocation. But I feel like maybe sometimes to a fault, it's become like idolized in a sense of like the vocation to marriage or the vocation to religious life or priesthood. Um, And people lose sight of the beauty of like living holiness in the here and now. And that... um, yeah, I think our vocation is the call to holiness, period. Yeah. And I think that um, we can almost like lose sight of God when we're become like hyper paranoid or obsessing on like, I just want to do as well. I just want to know what my vocation is. I. Mm-hmm. It's like when I reach that moment, then life begins. And it's like, no, like the life you're living now, like that's it. Just like focus on him in the moment and know like your vocation flows out of that relationship with him. And so yeah. it's like not a means to an end. Like you are not a means to an end. You are the end. Like your relationship with him is the end. Um, yeah. And it's not just like when I am in my quote unquote, like capital V vocation, then everything will make sense. It's like, no, what your life right now is so important. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, so I get a little <laughs> yeah. passionate about all of that because there's so much beauty. And I think the enemy can like easily distract us from just the beauty that's happening right in front of us if we're always like looking into the future because we're not guaranteed a future like we only have the here and now and jesus wants to meet us so um intimately and like use us in like being a vessel and like give us the grace to um really just encounter others and be holy in our everyday life yeah Mm -hmm. i relate a lot to that um Like I had always really felt called to marriage. There was a few months where I was actually discerning religious life, but really felt called to marriage for the majority of my life. And so when you have those moments where like you feel lonely or you feel like you are just like ready for that person or whatever, that's really hard. And then you start Mm -hmm. praying and like, I realized that sometimes my prayers would be so selfish. It was like, you know, I'm, I was told to pray for my future spouse. And so I am, but my prayers were were very selfish. Like, where is he? Why haven't you brought him to me yet? And in then like, that's what I was focusing in on. And there was a point in my life where, um, I intentionally did like a year fast from dating, just kind of realizing this, um, unhealthy clinging to like the future vocation or a person who I haven't met yet. And so I did this year fast and, um, that year actually, accidentally turned into three years because I think I just got really comfortable being single and, and like being independent with God. But it was in that time where I was switching my focus to praying, like, why haven't I met him yet to, you know, I hope wherever he is, you're encountering him so that Mm -hmm. when we, when we meet, we're ready to love each other like we should. And so I, I really feel like it was in the midst of like that transition in my own interior life that God was like, okay, I think you're ready now. And I feel like so often I hear from people who are maybe in that same place, like struggling with loneliness or just wanting to like meet that person and like thinking, you know, it's the grass is greener on the other side. I'll be happier when Mm -hmm. I, when I'm in my vocation, which isn't always the case, but I always, I always think like you have to love God first before you can love someone well, because if we don't love God and then we meet our spouse, like that person is going to become our God if we don't have that initial relationship with God first. And so like, that's where we're called to 
now in our life is not to like look to the future and get get frustrated that we're not living in the future but what is god trying to work in your heart now is that is that true of just vocation in general sister where like um if i'm if i'm discerning if i'm feeling a call toward religious life for example do do i have to come to that a similar place as kara mentioned where i love god more than the vocation to live that vocation well yeah i i would think so i feel like um the best way for me to articulate as i'm growing in my own obviously faith life with jesus and like growing in intimacy is can we hold everything as gift and not grasp i think anytime we start to like take the gift that could be or the gift that is and like and start to like lose i think it's a a lack of trust like we get nervous and we want to like start clinging on to it so I think even just like the idea of the vocation or even if you're currently in a, a state of life, a married state or a religious or consecrated state of life and like are clinging on to that, yeah, the, the, it could shift where we make that a God instead right. of God. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, I think there's a, a, a beautiful balance of like being able to tell God that ache, tell God that longing, like go there, but not um, but not become consumed or lost in desperation there that God can meet you in there and like speak truth and beauty into it. But I also feel like sometimes people think like, well, I didn't figure out the equation. Like I must be doing something that God's like withholding something from me. Um, Mm -hmm. like withholding my spouse or withholding the religious order or like, and he's not like he's a good father and he wants to give us good things and so i right. think sometimes it's like we miss the good things he wants to do in our everyday moments when we're like when we're like grasping onto an idea yeah you know and like yeah. his ideas are so much bigger yeah i'm in the midst of reading a book and it talks about like how sometimes god removes all of the things that bring us mm-hmm. comfort because he's trying to he's trying to do something within us. So he might not, you know, present that person to you. If you're called to marriage, he might not present that new job to you. If you're discerning, leaving your current job or whatever, whatever this discernment thing is for a different call, it might not like be readily available to you, but that isn't God not being a loving father. It's actually God being a loving father, exactly who he is because he's removing it because there's a lesson to be learned and there's something he's trying to do. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of times, like, when there is the struggle or the ache, it allows the person to really get to know themselves yeah. and their desires. Because, like, if that wasn't there, like, you would never have the opportunity to articulate, like, what is it actually in a spouse I desire? Like, what mm-hmm. are the virtues? What are the qualities? Why am I drawn to religious life or the priesthood? Like, when there is a lack in that, when there is a void, like, it's an opportunity to be able to say like, what is the heart desiring and how is God wanting to fulfill that? Um, and I feel like if everything is just like smooth sailing all the time, we never have to do that inner reflection and we never allow Jesus to like, um, kind of like draw out those desires from us so that we're aware of them. Yeah. Sometimes it takes being just like, in a real darkness to actually be willing to admit the things that we are oh, lacking yeah. and desiring. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm reading the same book Kara is, and there's this question in there that just really stood out to me. Of, if this is really what I'm supposed to do, should it be this hard? Mm-hmm. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I went to Franciscan university of Steubenville. Um, and as much as I love the university, it is God's university. Let's be clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a lot of folks that I, I, I have known that kind of get in that trap of, I just need to found my, find my spouse so I can live my vocation right. rather than the greatness mm-hmm. today and receiving the grace of the present moment and living in the present moment. And I've, I've seen where they start to get frustrated and go from frustration to frustration and almost desolation to desolation. It seems like right. that, right. like from the outside looking in. And they can find themselves feeling like God isn't speaking to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So what would you say to someone like that who feels like they're in that place and it feels like God isn't speaking to them at all? 
that this vocation's out there in the distance, but for some reason he's withholding it from them and, and they don't really understand where they are and they don't know what they want. And yeah. in some ways they don't necessarily know where they're going. What would you say to a person like that? Because I, I know there's a lot of folks out there like that that are listening. Right. Um, I think it's, first of all, giving the, giving the person, giving yourself permission to just really be able to be authentic in your emotion with the Lord. Like, if you're angry, be angry with him. But, like, mm -hmm. don't keep that from him. Like, tell him. Like, that is, to me, that's intimacy is, like, nothing's off the table. Like, we're going to talk about everything. And even if it's, like, I don't even know what's happening. I just know, like, I'm frustrated. I feel like you're withholding from me. Or why would you put a desire in my heart and not fulfill it? Like, I don't understand what's happening. I think being able to, like let that anger and frustration out has to be the first step mm -hmm. and then giving him the space to speak into that so if it's like more of a i don't even know what i desire or want i surprisingly see that a lot and i don't know to me i'm just wondering like how much of the busyness and like constant stimulation of social media all that stuff like if there's always noise i don't think we allow ourselves the freedom to actually just be and whenever we are just in silence it's uncomfortable yeah. so i think there is there is something to desires that we have to kind of cultivate what is it that you're really what is it that your heart is wanting and so i feel like the more time and silence or solitude with god the more you give your heart permission to actually speak yeah. and i think it's almost giving yourself permission to say like i first have to be honest with myself about what I want and that might be scary to admit um, because mm -hmm. I think like once you allow your heart to speak like in a sense there's no turning back because you've admitted it to yourself and I think perhaps sometimes people are too afraid to go there and so they just don't allow themselves the space to do it um, and then taking it to that next step like if I give myself the space to really just say what I really want um, can I invite God into that? And I see this happen a lot and it's happened in myself too, where it's like, I either don't think it's actually going to happen or I don't think I'm worthy or there's wounds in these areas that first need to be healed. Um, it's kind of like, what is keeping us back from being really free um, and free to be able to allow our desires to come forth. But I, I feel like silence is like a big part yeah. of kind of cultivating that that ache where the ache turns into naming something yeah mm -hmm. i think it was pope francis he talks about how um the conscience conscience is where we are able to hear the voice of god and mm -hmm. so i think that is very much a quiet element of spiritual warfare that we may not even identify as just all of the noise around us because the aim in that is that we don't take time to actually be quiet and still with our conscience and our mind to because that's where we hear the voice of God. And so we do have to enter into that silence. But I want to go back to what Fred said, the question that he asked, like, if this is really what I'm called to, yeah. should it really be this hard? And I, I think it's important to note, like what you're saying, sister, that doesn't mean there might not be darkness or there might not right. be suffering in the midst of responding to that call or even living in your vocation. What you're saying, sister, is like sometimes you have to be willing to actually admit it to yourself yeah. and that can be really hard because sometimes maybe you, you've just been like suppressing something that you actually know in your heart and and maybe it would hurt you maybe it would hurt someone who you love or in your life and it's hard to admit that especially if it's in relation to a vocation or a major life switch or something right. but so it doesn't mean that there might not be difficulties or hardships but there should also be joy in the midst yeah. of living that out and making that decision yeah. And I think a lot of the joy comes in that freedom of being able to say, like, this is where I'm at. And yes. there's there's a freedom and a joy that comes with um, just transparent vulnerability yeah. and and allowing yourself to just boldly trust to say, OK, I'm just going to trust um, that you're in this with me. And I, I think this is what happens is like we put too much pressure on ourselves. Yeah. Like we're mm -hmm. not God. I see it either go like in two extremes. Either we're like, whatever you want, Jesus, like I'll do whatever you want. Your will, your will, your will. And it's like kind of a cop out because he's like, I want to, like, I want you to be involved in mm -hmm. this like <laughs> collaboration. Yeah. 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 Or I see it swing to the other way where it's like, oh my gosh, I have to figure out 
Like, what does Jesus want? Am I doing the right thing? Is this my vocation? And it's like, right. then we leave him totally out of the picture. Yes. So it's like, how do we come to the balance where like, this is a relationship and like, yes. he wants to journey with us. He wants to help reveal our hearts to ourselves through our desires. And also the freedom to say like, here is the desire and I don't cling to it. Like, mm -hmm. do our desires line up? Like, I think there comes to a freedom and like, once you can name those desires, once you can name those longings that ultimately you do give them to him yeah. and say like, but whatever, like, I trust you with this. I trust you with the, the caretaking of my heart that you know right. how to best fulfill it. Because maybe I don't, maybe this is a desire you put on my heart and you want to fulfill it in a different way that I'm not even aware of. Right. So yeah, I think the, the, Christian life, the cross can never be removed from it, but there's also the resurrection that comes with it. It's never just going to be the cross on it. It's, it's, yes. it's a whole paschal mystery in it. Right. Still the joy. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. How can someone identify if like, into, that's that, that first extreme that you mentioned, mm -hmm. how can someone identify interiorly if they are, you know, saying your will, God, I want my will to be your will, or if that's just kind of like, I'm just going to let you do it. And then it's removing all accountability on me. And right. if it, you know, if it's supposed to happen, it'll happen because there is a level of just like patient trust. Right. Um, but how can someone identify if interiorly, maybe I'm asking this for myself, if interiorly <laughs> they're being patient and just waiting and trusting for God, or if it's, you know, for lack of a better word, a cop out and they're just like, uh, I'm just going to hang out here and you're going to have to do it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's um, a certain amount of peace that comes with it. Like, I feel the only analogy I could think of is like a woman who's pregnant. Mm -hmm. Like, they know that there's something in the waiting, that something is growing and taking life. And it's like, we're just waiting for it to come to completion versus like, mm -hmm. I'm just out in the middle of nowhere and I don't hear you anymore or I don't know what's happening. You know, like, mm -hmm. I think there's something with the waiting where there's ultimately a, a, a peace that comes with it yeah. and that the disposition of the heart is like i'm i'm ready to make moves when you want me to make moves like i'm yeah. i'm open and i'm aware and i'm just going to continue to focus on you and let you direct me so like if all of a sudden i feel like i don't see you anymore or i don't have clarity like to to reconnect with him in the way of like, okay, where are we at now? Like what's yeah. going on? Yeah. But yeah, I think a certain element of peace comes even amidst the uncertainty. Like just because there's uncertainty there doesn't mean that God isn't there. Like yeah. God is in the uncertainty. I think of the, uh, of the apostles in the upper room, like right. they were probably really uncertain after Jesus died, but then when he showed up and he, you know, he stays with them. And then when he ascends, he says, wait here. And they wait in the upper room for, for nine days and, you know, not really knowing what's supposed to happen, but knowing that something is going to happen and just trusting in God. Like they had to have a peace in the midst of those several days, just waiting for, for, you know, Pentecost. So yeah, I do, I do definitely think that that's something that we have to consciously be aware in our own souls um and our in our own interior life like are we at a state of peace with god yeah. in our relationship yeah. and what we're discerning mm -hmm. for sure i love how you tied in the childbirth analogy because uh, you know at, as i was asking that question about um should it really be this hard the scripture that came to mind mm -hmm. was Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite verses. I've, we've mentioned it probably on yeah. many of our podcasts, but, um, but that's the whole idea. I, I think motherhood, childbirth, as I'm expecting a sixth, <laughs> a sixth child that yeah, I've yeah. watched my wife mm -hmm. yeah. give birth to soon. So I can't fully relate as a man, obviously, but witnessing it like mm -hmm. all the it's been a very difficult pregnancy yeah. for her and yet the joy of getting to hold francis claire mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in a couple months you know yes. she would do it all over again um and for all of our children it's been that way mm -hmm. but yet it's not easy so there's that promise there's that living what she's called to there's that gift from god that is a critical part of her vocation but it comes with a cross that she has to bear, right? you know, in, in pregnancy, in childbirth. Yeah. And Kara, you could speak to that obviously better than I could, but mm -hmm. I don't know. That just came, I, I just, I just see a lot of that in what you're saying. Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, it's easy to relate to that analogy as, as a mother because there is peace in the waiting, even in the difficult moments or the scary right. moments or, you know, the high risk moments or whatever it might be. And I think one of the questions that comes to mind is in the midst of kind of that hardship, whether it's in this analogy or just in your life mm -hmm. when you're trying to make a decision and you're struggling with it or you have made a decision and there's a cross involved you know, how does someone continue in the discernment? Because I know you're you're trained in like Ignatian spirituality and right. kind of kind of that discernment. So, like in the midst of desolation um, or crosses, how does someone move forward in their discernment? Right. Yeah. So Ignatius is really big on never. Um, if you make a decision in a place of peace, and then later on, the a cross comes never change your decision in a desolation yeah like if you are experiencing desolation if you are experiencing um desperation like never change your mind in that moment like you always have to come back to a place of peace so if the original decision was made in a piece of in a place of peace and prayer like remain in that mm -hmm. and then like if you're starting to experience desolation, like still remain in it until you come back to a place of peace. And then if you're like, no, I do need to like change what I decided, like, okay, go with it. But like never make a decision in a moment of despair or desolation. Like you always have to come back to that grounding of, of peace, um, that the Lord wants to speak into that. And so I think for me, the best thing about desolation consolation is it's really like the movement of like are you pulling away from jesus or towards him yeah like in the hard times are we clinging to him like that's the only where way when clinging is good it's like where we're clinging to him i think mm -hmm. are we like clinging to jesus or are we drawing away from him and so like can we cling to him and hear his voice so that we can have clarity on the situation but like stay at the foot of the cross like don't leave the cross stay there yeah. um, until you have some clarity. I know you and I have talked about this, like, um, the specific differences between consolation and desolation. Mm -hmm. Like it's not only about your feelings, right. um, but w like which direction you're going towards. Right. So can you speak a little to that? And then maybe even how can someone begin or continue, um, in their own spiritual life to make sure that they're clinging to Christ or clinging to, you know, his cross. Right. Yeah. Just to speak personally, like, I feel like when I've encountered really hard struggles in my life, the feelings are not great. So it, it's like non-spiritual desolation where the, the actual, um, circumstances don't have to do necessarily with the spiritual life. Um, but it's bringing me to a place of, I can choose how I want to now interact with God. Do I let him in or do I pull away? So non-spiritual desolations could lead me to spiritual consolation or spiritual desolation. Mm -hmm. So like if a family member dies or something happens really tragic, um, I can easily, you know, get mad at Jesus and then leave, you know, like, or I can be mad at Jesus and draw near. That would still be like a consolation because I'm drawing near to him in the mm -hmm. hardship. So often the, the desolation and consolation will mix, like they'll intertwine with each other. It's not so black and white, yeah. um, and at least in my experience. But it's just, for me, the big question I always ask is what direction am I going? Am I drawing to him in these hardships or am I pulling away? Mm -hmm. I can draw to him and still be upset with him. Um, and that's like what I love about the beauty of Martha is like in the story of Martha and Mary, like Martha was like so free in her relationship that she was able to complain and like be yeah. upset. Like, I feel like to me, that's like such a beautiful intimacy is to say like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how I feel in this moment, but I'm not going to leave. Or if like, a, you know, a husband and wife, if they're like in an argument, but they're like, we need to stay in this house. Like it's going to get messy and it's going to get complicated and but we're, we're not going to leave until we like we're going to remain in here and i think that's like what can happen is like in our relationship with the lord like things can be messy and hard and complicated but it's like i'm going to remain with you until we sort this out um right. i'm not going to leave i'm not going to um withdraw because i know that you're with me through through and through like you're faithful no matter what Right. I think of um, Mother Teresa, too. Like she talked about how she had, you know, 40 years 
of Mm -hmm. feeling the dark night of the soul and not feeling that like maybe spiritual consolation, but throughout, I mean, she had every movement of her heart towards God. So even Mm -hmm. if she wasn't in a place of spiritual desolation, she was still in consolation because her movements were towards God. I think she's also uh, like a really powerful example of being faithful where you are today and saying yeah. yes today too, because I mean, she felt this call within a call and, and knew what she was called to in, in her starting a, a religious order, but she didn't immediately do that. You know, like she didn't freeze up and just say, well, I'm not doing it yet. So what am I supposed to do? She just gave every single day, gave a simple yes and trusted in God. And she started by walking the streets of India with a few coins in her pocket and picking up a homeless dying man and taking him to the hospital. And that's how her order started was just yeah. her trusting in God and every step of the way moving towards him. And so I think there is that beautiful example that we have in Martha, but also in our saints that we um, just celebrated in the church um, to look to like, how am I supposed to live a holy life today? Even though we look at the saints and we're like, wow, they did such big things. How are we supposed to just simply say yes to God every day? Right. And I feel like the biggest, to me, it all boils down to one thing. And that's like exactly what happened in the garden. And this is why we lend towards it because it's, it's part of our, our original sin. Like the effects of it is like, ultimately it all comes down to, do we trust that God is a loving father? And he has good plans for us and wants to give us everything. I feel like all of everything, when it comes down to it, it's all an attack on that. Mm -hmm. And to be able to say like, can I have the bold trust? Like, can I, can I really, really believe that in the mundane, in the greatness, in the trials that you have good plans for me, that you are not going to abandon me, that you are faithful, um, I feel like that for me is every day, multiple times a day, so many times a day, I have to continue to redirect myself to say like, do I trust that he's faithful? Do I trust that he's loving me? Do I trust that he desires my goodness? How can I like open myself to that, open and receive instead of like wanting to like close down and, um, and get scared and nervous and, you know, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As, as you're, saying that i want to go back to something you mentioned uh, a little bit ago and that was the idea of wounds because i feel like mm-hmm. wounds are the thing that stand in the way i think oftentimes at least from my experience of uh realizing that he is a good father and he does have yeah. a good plan for us and he does love us so what what role do you think personal wounds and hurts play in that process of finding yeah. living that greatness and how do we overcome those wounds yes oh this is like one of my favorite topics Fred. <laughs> so excited um no i feel like there's such power in wounds um and i think just like the fact that jesus and his resurrected body has his wounds says everything like yeah. that mm. is just such a beautiful meditation but i feel like um there are always two people fighting for your wounds the enemy wants to come in come in and like fester in there and and aggravate it and make you um identify as the wound is your identity and Mm -hmm. he wants you to kind of um re react to those wounds and live out of them where jesus wants to come into those wounds and speak love and healing and allow you to respond to them Um, I know I struggled a lot with a specific wound and I kept going to spiritual direction and confession and I kept saying like, why do I keep struggling with this? Why do like, I'm doing everything I can. And the priest was like, sister, that's what heaven is, is when we don't have those struggles anymore. And so it was just an insight to me is like, Jesus may, may allow the wound to exist because it's such a source of grace. Like I just picture all this grace flowing out of it because if I can claim and own the wounded areas of my life Mm -hmm. and allow when I'm being triggered or being upset or those hurts are flaring up, invite him into it. He is going to come and like just create such beauty from that wound. And so that actually, it just Mm -hmm. reminds me of like what St. Paul says, like in our weakness, or I'm not a biblical person that, I mean, you know what I mean? I don't, memorize yeah. this is yeah. very great um but just like in our <laughs> in, in something about like in our weakness um my 
Jesus says, my power is perfected in weakness. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Kara. It's a thorn yeah. in the side. Yeah. Exactly. Like yeah. in, in our woundedness and our weakness, like he makes so many beautiful things happen. And so I kind of see my wounds as not my identity, but a source of like such grace because I don't let them consume me anymore. And I, I'm learning not how to react out of them, but to respond to them by inviting Jesus to come in and continue to speak truth even if he allows them to remain because if they were gone yeah. um yeah and i just feel like also in my ministry so much like the wounds that i carry are exactly the people that i'm ministering to so it's like the woundedness almost draws with the woundedness in others and it's like it's such a beautiful um way the holy spirit like works through my own wounds to have a different level of empathy and compassion with those i minister to and so i see how they are gift because I know very deeply where people are coming from. I, the image that came to my mind when you were talking was the divine mercy image, like just mm. his his wound in his side, and it's mercy that flows through the you know the water of baptism and the and the blood of the Eucharist. So, it, you know, it it's mercy that like through our wounds, God wants to give us more mercy and more love. Right. And if we right. allow that to happen, that brings great healing. Mm -hmm. We also see that the very first time Christ proclaims the gospel, he's quoting Isaiah. Uh, and he talks about, I've come to give the oil of joy uh, mm. for mourning and my favorite beauty for ashes, mm. to give them beauty for ashes. And that's exactly what he does to transform that womb. Um, so when I've had a, a rare moments where I've been able to share some parts of my testimony with folks and, and it usually happens where they have similar wounds, you know, and, and uh, on one occasion, somebody said I'm sorry that you had to go through that and I kind of had the moment where I realized you know I would do it I'm glad I did because now I can help you yeah. and I would do it all over again mm -hmm. and I think I don't know we have to kind of see our wounds that way I feel like rather than ki nursing our wounds and making pets of them if that mm -hmm. makes sense and living in that that hurt place of hurt and right. owning that as our identity yeah um right have you, sister, have you ever read, we talk about this, Fred, have you ever read the book Great Divorce by yes. C.S. Lewis? Oh, he's my favorite. Yeah. Well, like we talked, we talk about that, um, Fred and I do, like that, there's one character in there where, um, so basically it's like somebody, they're, they're taking like this field trip on a bus to basically go up to heaven and they, uh, they meet people who are supposed to help them. Um, stay there and a lot of people choose through whatever reason and whatever sin or whatever attachment uh, to not stay there and there's one character who um, they have this pet and it's like a, a person who has a leash and the actual person who was on earth is the one who's leashed um, because their wound is the one who's like dragging them along on the leash and you just see like the you, you just see this progression of the person starts very 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 small and they just start growing and growing and they're like almost ready to overcome their wound and then they just shrink and disappear like their wound overtakes them yeah. and so i i, I love that imagery because mm -hmm. i think we can do that we just kind of like you know stroke our wound like it's our pet um or that it's we're their pet you know what right. i mean and so at some point we have to seek that healing to move forward in discernment or to move forward to wherever God is calling us. Right. And then when receiving that, let the wound go and be okay. Letting the wound go. Right. Yeah. And I'm yes, 100%. I always feel like, remember the cross is not just for the cross for the cross's sake. Like yeah. there is a resurrection. Yes. And I think there's something about the healing process. Like you have to deeply go there and and have all the emotions, but never by yourself, always with Jesus. Yes. And to, to experience the healing by going through the cross, but being sure you're coming out the other end. And yeah. I'm just really big about like, um, spiritual direction and, um, reconciliation confession, but also like if someone needs like, um, counseling or therapy, like that the Lord wants us to be whole people mm -hmm. and that the importance of having that, that sometimes we can't put a spiritual band-aid on a psychological yeah. wound you know like that the lord m might say like you also i would desire to have you supported in this area too um to, for the healing process so i think yeah for people to know like do not just remain at the cross to be there um right. to punish yourself or suffer but to know that there's a purpose and it's, it's coming out into the resurrection and so never stay there alone 
Um, Mm -hmm. Always have Jesus present, but be willing to move through because I think we can get, like you're saying, we can get really comfortable in our woundedness because healing is freedom. And sometimes even the uncomfortableness of our wounds, like we make it our identity because it's the only thing we've known and we're afraid to be free. Or it's Um, kind of like, yeah, kind of like the whole desire topic. Like sometimes, you know, freedom requires like responsibility and an ownership. And sometimes it's really hard to allow ourselves the permission to be really free because it's scary. Yeah. Um, Yeah. When you were talking, Fred, like I would endure it all over again just for this, like just to be able to help you who the, who the person is standing in front of you. I thought of Jesus. Didn't Jesus say that? Was it to Teresa of Avila? Yeah. yeah. I would, I, w- I would create the whole world again just to hear mm. you say you love me. You, yeah, yeah. You love me. Yeah. And he says that about the cross. He would endure the cross for every single one of us all over again for, you know, for the sake of our souls. Mm. And so, yeah, yeah. I definitely think there's, um, there's something to be said about wounds and how they influence our decision making and our discernment because we can either hang on to them um, right. and you know place whatever God is calling us right. to in the wound and sometimes like you said like Satan also wants to get in the, get in our wound and disrupt it and open it wider and right. and maybe he uses that to pull you away from you know true discernment or what we're truly called to and so you know we have to really be okay um, identifying it um, yeah. and working through it with Christ and and yeah, like you said with I, other people. Yeah, and I feel like the the biggest like point blank question I just asked myself throughout the day is like, oh, I'm triggered. Am I responding or am I reacting? Yeah. I, I want to be responding. I don't want to just be living out of it. I want to um, be gentle with myself. I want to invite Jesus into it. So I feel like that's a good, just simple like refocusing like how where am I at? Right. What mm-hmm. whose voice am I listening to right now? Yeah. 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 We've already touched on this a little bit, but I do want to go back to like what advice might you give to somebody who not just in the discernment process of vocations, but just discernment of anything in their life, you know, any major decision or small decision, whatever it might be like, what advice would you give to them to move forward or even to just start in a discernment process? Yeah. I feel like, um, I'll hit on Ignatian tradition. There's like the big three, um, I'm stealing from father to Mindy Gallagher a little bit, but Mm -hmm. he says, um, um, it's awareness, understanding action. So I feel like most people, we get, we stop at the understanding. Um, so I think it's just an awareness. Oh, there's something I'm drawn to, something I'm attracted to, something I desire. Mm-hmm. Like, can we come to a place where we're aware of the interior movements of our hearts, our desires, but then not stop there, but try to understand it. And actually discernment means unlayering, kind of like unpacking. So mm-hmm. pulling back those layers, like, okay, I realize I'm attracted or drawn to this or desire marriage. Why? Like to, to continue to unflesh that, you know, like to say like what's happening underneath to really be able right. to articulate um, the deeper things that the Lord wants to fulfill. And then it's like being able to take action. And and I know this is about just in general, but I'll just use vocation discernment as an as a example is like a lot of times I'll have girl, I'm vocation director, a lot of times I'll have girls be like, well, before I come and visit, like, I just, I need to know if I'm called to religious life. And it's like, okay, we have to take an action. Right. Like you can't, the same thing with dating. Like I can't look at this man and say like, oh, that's going to be my husband without ever having <laughs> talked to him. <laughs> like, I think there's only so much reflection and discernment that can happen in our minds. We actually have to have lived tangible experiences to be able to discern with. Right. And a lot of times, like taking an action, like moving forward only in doing that, then we might say like, oh, this wasn't the right decision. Yeah. So like, there's never going to be a guarantee before you move forward on this is the right decision. Sometimes discernment happens as you're living the experience and you're like, yep, I think this is maybe not for me or no, this date, no, we're not meant to be, you know, stuff like that. So I think being, being aware taking time and prayer and silence to understand what's the deeper element of what's happening and then not being afraid to take action and move forward when you're feeling like the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Um, And I think it's that third step that people want to do. I see a lot in this culture, people want to take action um, before doing the other two steps Mm -hmm. or people do the other two steps and they're just too afraid to take that action because of a perfectionism, like I have to have this right. Right. So it's like, no, they, they all go together. Let it like flow naturally. Let it go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always think of St. Joseph, like he like 
discerned um, for so many different levels, like either the, I know Father Callaway talks about like the unworthiness of like knowing like I, how can I be um, present to like what's happening, you know? Like I feel like he made a decision and then in that decision, like the Lord redirected him. So it's like, God's not gonna leave us stranded and be like, oh, you made that decision. Good luck now. You know, like he's yeah. with us in it. He's with us in it. So Joseph always gives me such consolation because it's like, let that be an example for me. Right. What decision are you referring to? His decision to... Yeah, when he was going to, like, divorce Mary. Right, yes. Yeah, where it was like he really prayed and discerned about that. Right. And he was moving forward, going to move forward with it. And then, like, you know, the angel in the dream was like, no. So it was like, to me, that's like, whoa, Joseph was like a discerning man. And right. I should not be afraid to, like, move forward with things, trusting that I will be able to hear the voice of God to know if that decision is actually not where I'm meant to be, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. And then in, even in his action to the redirection to say yes to Mary and to be the earthly right. father of Jesus, like God was still there directing him and guiding yeah. him as yeah. a father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you were the one who told me about like something that your friend experienced in prayer about the Holy family. I mentioned this actually in an episode. I hope you don't mind that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but like, I find a lot of, peace and comfort in that especially in the context of this conversation like living out holiness every day can you share a little bit better than probably what i did like kind of what that what that was for your friend like in the holy family with the holy family yeah i think my friend was having a, a prayerful meditation about the holy family and kind of like saying to them like how like how did you do that like were you just so focused on like what your role was in the plan and like what was going to happen you know as the Holy Family and like Mary, what your role would look like, the specifics and Joseph, like what your, and just felt really strongly in his prayer experience that Joseph was Joseph and Mary, but especially Joseph was like, no, we were just, we were just enjoying watching our little boy grow up. Yeah, like they were so present to him, like they weren't caught up or like overwhelmed by like their role as the parents of of God. You know, like that right. they were like, no, we're just we're just enjoying. Yeah. her son mm -hmm. and like getting lost in that and not so concerned about like not in a um, like lazy way about their purpose but they were just enjoying the face of god before them and knowing yeah. that their yeah. role would was their role and they didn't need to worry about it yeah that's awesome because I, I feel like i know a lot of people that struggle with you know they feel like i'm, I'm called to this particular thing or this great thing that I have a desire to do. Um, but they let like every little thing in the meantime, even the most mundane thing, they approach those things with such fear. Like if they don't do it exactly right, somehow mm -hmm. they're going to completely miss. Right. And they'll mess right. it up. The, yeah, yeah. And they'll completely miss. They'll ruin God's plan for their lives. Right. But I think God's a little bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I hear that in what you're saying with the Holy family is they pondered it in their heart. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, every little thing wasn't, oh, we're going to mess us all up. Yeah. God's bigger than that. And like the Holy Family was, I mean, they were just raising their son, but they yeah. were also having consistent movements towards God. And so God was blessing right. them in mm -hmm. the midst of that. So we can just mm -hmm. right. simply live in the present. Maybe you have a, a foresight of your greater mission and what God calls you to or your vocation, but simply living present in the moment and being faithful to God that is going to bring about what you're called to. Exactly. Well, obviously we have more to talk about and I'm sure we could keep this conversation going forever. Yes. Um, so we'll just have to have you back as a guest again. Um, but thank you everyone for listening. Hopefully this has been helpful. If you are discerning any major decision in your life, whether it is a big V vocation, maybe it's a small V vocation or a career change or a move across the, the country, whatever it might be like, like just we, we hope that this conversation has really brought to light where to take your discernment and how to start your discernment and root it in Christ and what he is speaking to you. So thank you for listening to Draw Near and thank you, sister, for being our guest. Thank you so much.